All right, uh, uh, people, uh, and those of you who are live streaming, again, um, uh, not just people in the room, but uh, lots of people are online. All of this will be down, we'll, you'll be able to download all the presentation and do binge watching of them because I know that's what we all like to do here in Greater Victoria. Um, and as well, when you do that, because the question was earlier about the rap song in the earlier presentation, the rap song will be on the download as well. Um, anyway, I'd like to welcome our next presenters. Uh, they are uh, from Lakeside and they will be doing their presentation now. Uh, on their submission and what possibilities they have for our wastewater treatment here in Victoria. So, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Sorry we're late. Uh, we did get to see uh, much of the greater Victoria area in the last hour, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start off, I'm going to be talking about basically four products that we submitted. Uh, give you a little history on our company. Uh, we were founded in 1928, so we're actually 87 years old. We've been around for a long time, very well known. Um, we're very unique in that we're employee owned. Uh, there's no family involved. Uh, the average employee has been with Lakeside about 15 and a half years. So when you deal with anybody in our company, you're dealing with an owner. Uh, we are based uh, in the United States. Uh, our sales offices are in Bartlett, Illinois, in the Chicago area, just west of Chicago. Uh, we have our sales engineering service and parts uh, people at the main corporate office. We do fabricate in Sheraton, Iowa. Uh, we don't own our uh, fabricator, but they have made all of our equipment since 1940. So we've had quite a good relationship. Uh, we're about two-thirds of their business. The other third of their business, they do work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They're an AISC Category 1 shop, which they can build just about anything in the U.S. We also do controls with our equipment. Uh, typically, we work with a local control supplier. They are UL and Canadian UL certified. So uh, we can provide controls uh, in Canada. Our representative is ProMag Enviro Systems Limited. Uh, I have Ken McGaw, our rep here. Ken has worked with Lakeside for 40 years. So we have a very good relationship with Ken. Uh, the products that we submitted on, and I'm going to talk very briefly on today, are screening, screening raw wastewater coming into the plant, grit removal, grit is sand and other uh, non-biodegradable material that comes into the plant, uh, clarifiers, which are the devices uh, that settle or separate solids, either as a primary or a secondary clarifier, and then uh, finally, our closed loop reactor process. Uh, the first product that we submitted on were our Raptor fine screens. Uh, just some photos, uh, various places we've worked all over the world. Um, the benefits of fine screening is if you're a treatment plant operator, you want to avoid pipe blockages, reduce pump maintenance. You want your clarifier, your process to work very well. Uh, you do not want uh, floatables in your clarifier. Uh, you don't want the feed wells to plug up. Uh, there's less cleaning of uh, the clarifier wears. Uh, in your biological process, if you have a lot of stringing material, you don't want diffusers to foul with rags and uh, stringing material. When you treat your solids in your digester, you don't want to put non-biodegradable materials in there because it reduces the, the effectiveness of the process performance. So by taking non-biodegradables out, uh, you also improve your digestion or your solids process. We also know that if you are dewatering or drying sludge, 
uh, you get better performance by taking the non-biodegradable materials out. And you get a quick cleaner waste sludge, depending on what you're going to do ultimately with the waste solids. If they're uh, land-filled or land-applied, uh, you aren't going to see stuff that you don't want to see in your sludge. And that's very important to a lot of people these days. Uh, the screens are based on peak flow, and one of the uh, things that I faced uh, with the inquiry was I got average flows. So in our submittal, I assumed a, a peak flow, and that can vary from plant to plant. We designed screening and grit removal based on peak flow, not average flow. Our Raptor screens are very unique. Uh, they've been very well accepted. Uh, very innovative in that they combine three unit processes into one device. The openings are generally uh, 13 millimeters and smaller. Uh, our standard opening is 6 millimeter. Uh, we do have screens that go down to 2 millimeters. All of the screens not only remove material, they wash the material to take the fecal material out in a two-stage washing system. So the screenings, uh, when they go into a dumpster or are being disposed of, don't have any visible fecal material. Each screen compacts and dewaters the screenings. And uh, the screenings are compacted to about 40 to 50% dry solids. So what happens is, is for the raw screenings, for every cubic meter that comes in, you get a half cubic meter out. Meter out. You also reduce the weight by two thirds. And so what the, the benefit of this is, is if you are landfilling this material, you've got half the volume and a third the weight. It saves you considerable costs and it's much more environmentally friendly. Uh, hope you have, I see some people are eating. This is a conventional screen and this is the type of screenings that you get. Uh, see a lot of visible fecal material there. With the Raptor screen, what comes off kind of looks like paper mache. We've washed the screenings, compacted and dewatered the screenings uh, to about 40 to 50 percent dry solids. Our standard features, our screens are completely fabricated of stainless steel. There is no carbon steel. Uh, we use very low power, uh, either a 1.5, 2.2, or 3.7 kilowatt motor. So there's very little power involved with our screens for energy savings. They are very simple mechanical design in that there's only one motorized moving part, unlike many screens that can have hundreds of parts. It is enclosed, the screens can be enclosed for odor control depending on where uh, a plant is uh, located. If you have residential homes, odor is a big issue. So uh, the screens are enclosed, can be enclosed in the channel for odor control. For the service people who have to maintain the equipment, the screens pivot out of the channel for service. Uh, typically our screens operate only four to 600 hours in a year. So they only run when they need to run. Uh, this reduces the maintenance costs. There are no bearings to grease. Uh, the only routine maintenance is change the uh, oil, like in your car, uh, change it three times a year. And this shows a typical fine screen. We have a screen basket, a seal plate, because this goes, you got a round screen and a rectangular channel, a rake and comb to clean the screen, a transport screw to transport the screenings out of the channel, a compaction zone to squeeze all the water out, uh, the drive assembly, either uh, 1.5, 2.2, or 3.7 kilowatts. We have a wash manifold with solenoid valves that directs flow either to the lower wash, the screenings wash, or the compaction zone flush system. The bar spacings are uh, 6, 10, or 13 millimeter. 6 millimeter is standard. Uh, for us Americans, that's a quarter inch. Um, 
We offer nine different screen sizes depending upon the peak flow rate. And so in our proposal, we uh, proposed a number of combinations of screens depending on how many megaliters uh, uh, we had to treat. The screens go from basically 8.3 megaliters to 103, 104 megaliters uh, with the biggest screens. The basket, this is just a photo of the basket to give an idea uh, how heavy duty this is. That's uh, uh, 2.54 centimeters or one inch thick stainless steel. It's a very, very heavy duty uh, screen. The screen is unique in that it has three different bar planes. And the advantage of this is, is uh, we can have a rotary rake that passes completely through the bars. The three uh, planes form storage areas. So when wastewater comes in, this line is typical uh, uh, depth of the water with no screenings. The screenings come along blind off the screenings. You can actually, as the screen blinds, you can remove materials that are smaller than the six millimeter spacing. And then as uh, the screens blind off the screen, the water level comes up and more and more screenings are accumulated until uh, it's time to clean the screen. These screens clean themselves in anywhere, depending on the size, uh, as uh, quickly as five seconds, and the longest one takes 12 seconds. Again, the units are all stainless steel. Our standard is 304 stainless. When we get uh, near the ocean or we have high chlorides due to salt water, we go to a higher grade 316 stainless. So that shows the three plane bar rack, the rotary rake, the screw. Uh, there is a cleaning comb that knocks material off uh, that doesn't come off by gravity and uh, the first stage wash system. This is just a video of a tank mounted design. This is actually a septage receiving unit, but it's the same screen that we propose for your, uh, your projects. And so the flow comes in, the rake makes one revolution and uh, uh, cleans the screen. It's the only screen on the market where the teeth pass all the way through the bars. And so grease and uh, other materials will never ever clog the screen. As the screenings uh, are raked off, uh, there's a screw conveyor that drives the rake. It augers the material out of the uh, screen where it's washed twice and then compacted. I've turned the wash system off in that video. The next video shows the spray wash system. And so the, the screenings that come off this unit are very clean, very, very dry. We use a heavy duty drive assembly. Uh, it's very unique in this industry uh, in that it's a cycloidal helical drive that was designed by the Germans prior to World War II for their tanks and their U-boats. Uh, we do both an inline and a right angle. And with a cycloidal drive, you always have 40% of the gears engaged, which if you're familiar with transmissions, a lot of times with helical gearing, you only have one to two teeth. With a cycloidal drive, you have 40% of your gears engaged. This allows the drive to take a 400 or 500% shock load, recognizing that you never know what's coming down the sewer. I've seen shopping carts, uh, carburetors, uh, paint cans, you know, bricks, you never know. Uh, the drive we use is a member of uh, the American, which includes the Canadians uh, Gear Manufacturers Association. Uh, so it is a certified drive. Uh, we use very high torque ratings compared to other screens, uh, typically twice the torque ratings. So depending on the size of the screen, uh, we, we'll be using about twice the, the torque rating on the drive. We also use about twice the thrust rating so it's very important from the maintenance and, and operators, they want a big heavy duty uh, drive assembly. We also use what's called a taper grip bushing. If you uh, were like me as a kid, ever saw the Chinese uh, 
finger torture device where you put your fingers in, you can't get it out. That's the type of uh, uh, connection that we make to the screw conveyor versus an old-fashioned key or keyway that in, an, in a headworks environment, very corrosive. The keys and keyways, uh, they will corrode and actually, uh, sometimes the only way to get a reducer off in that environment is to get the it, uh, cutting torch out. Uh, we use a state, what's called a standard NEMA C-face motor. And the nice thing about that is, is if uh, the motor were to burn out, take a lightning strike, you can go to any motor shop in the area and get a NEMA C-face motor. Some manufacturers use a gear motor, which is integral to the speed reducer. Sometimes it's very hard to find a replacement gear motor without going back to that original manufacturer. So we use a, a NEMA C-face motor. This just shows the drive assembly. I'll quickly go through this. There's the uh, uh, inline drive. We use a lower bearing. That's a common question by the plant operators. Is the lower bearing? Yes, there is. It's a sleeve bearing uh, called Garmax. It's self-lubricated, non-metallic, so it doesn't corrode. Uh, it has a five to 10,000 hour life. If you remember, our screens only run four to 600 hours per year. If you do have to replace it, I did do the conversion. It's $145 Canadian, so not very much money. There are dual seals to keep uh, the wastewater out. There's a stainless wear sleeve that the seals ride on, so you have a wearing surface uh, over a long period of time. We water pressurize the bearing uh, to keep grit and sand and other contaminants out of the bearing. And uh, the bearing housing is entirely field replaceable. So worst case scenario, uh, it wears over 20 years. If the housing is damaged, it's a bolt-on design. All of the screens pivot out of the channel for service. For odor control, we offer two types of bagging attachments. This is an individual bag uh, with a 113 liter bag. We also do a continuous hose bagger with 80 meters of hose. So we'll bag the screenings. That way you don't get odors, you don't track flies, uh, rodents, whatever. Where we do multiple screens or we need to convey the screenings, we can do a cross conveyor to uh, convey the screenings uh, rather than, than just dump them out of the screens. If the units are located outdoors um, or indoors uh, where there's no heat, we can weather protect them using heat tracing, uh, removable FRP covers, uh, where the FRP, we actually sandwich the insulation in between two layers of uh, fiberglass that way you don't have to worry about water getting into the insulation. Uh, anybody who's worked with uh, like fiberglass uh, insulation knows you, when you get it wet, it loses its insulation capabilities. Uh, all of our weather packages uh, are easy to assemble, disassemble, which is important if the heat trace ever needs replacing. We also do a Teflon blanket uh, type uh, cover where we sandwich the insulation in between an inner and outer layer of Teflon fabric, and that's connected with Velcro. This shows our fiberglass design on the left. Uh, these are the fiberglass covers. If you unscrew six thumb screws, uh, the whole cover comes off to allow the maintenance people to get access uh, to the wash systems. So there's couple of band clamps, uh, six thumb screws, and then you can see the whole cover's been lifted off on this design, so it makes it very easy to ex access uh, the solenoid valves and the heat tracing. This shows the Teflon blanket. Uh, this is a cost-saving design, not as pretty as the fiberglass, but it certainly does uh, a good job. Another thing we can do is we can put uh, uh, stainless covers uh, with rolling doors to uh, allow the plant maintenance staff to see the operation of the screen if they're outdoors, uh, and also allows uh, access to the screen. 
We can also tank mount any of our screens. So in a pre-engineered tank, rather than put it in a concrete channel, if there's a pump station to the plant, we can actually tank mount these screens and save construction costs rather than build a, a concrete channel. This shows an installation. It was actually a retrofit out on Long Island, New York, where they had a pump station and uh, the pumps were getting uh, um, plugged with the disposable wipes, which are becoming a real, real issue in wastewater treatment these days. So we installed a tank mounted screen prior to the pumps. Uh, Lakeside does do the control panels. Uh, uh, we designed it either per the International Electrotechnical Commission standards or uh, NEMA National Electrical Manufacturers Association, depending on what's required. Uh, all of our panels that would come up here are uh, Canadian UL labeled as a standard. Uh, if you're uh, doing controls as an operator, if they're outdoors, you can put the panel right next to the equipment. If it's indoors, Typically, you have an explosion-proof environment, so you want to remote mount the main panels. Typically, that's in a NEMA uh, 412 enclosure. If it's outdoors, uh, we put it in a stainless enclosure so that it's water, uh, water resistant, uh, uh, snow resistant. We can also do fiberglass. Uh, all of our controls uh, will use a, what's called a molar easy relay, which is an industrial controller, but we can upgrade to an Allen Bradley, what's called a programmable logic controller. It's like a smart computer, basically, in a small package. Or we can do standard relays and timers the old-fashioned way, so it's really up to what the, the engineer and the, the plant operations staff uh, desire. We use a variable frequency drive. It's like a speed adjustment uh, on the motor, and that gives us a lot of advantages in that we can do a soft start where we start the screen very slowly, slow it down very slowly. Uh, we get true power or kilowatt overload protection. We can also, because these screens start and stop and reverse, we can actually use what's called DC injection braking. It's like putting a a brake on the motor to slow it down rather than just run it forward, stop it, and then hit it in reverse. Uh, it makes for a much longer life on the drive. And it provides the operations people status indication. We can do, uh, we put a, what's called a transient voltage surge suppressor. Uh, this is for lightning uh, or, or stray voltages that uh, may come uh, through the wires to protect it. There's a door mounted running time meter and then that we presented a lot of options uh, in our proposals that you can add into the control panels. Operators have different things they like. So uh, we gave a lot of options uh, with uh, what we offer. And again, it's a uh, Canadian UL label. When you have an explosion proof environment, you don't want to have all the switches remote uh, in another room or outdoors for the operations and maintenance staff. So we provide a local control station where we put all the switches. And that's usually a handoff switch for the screen, the solenoid valves. There's a forward off reverse switch for the screen. There's a cycle reset push button. Uh, and it's in an explosion-proof enclosure, so if something should happen, you're not going to blow the building up. Another feature that we offer, I think we're the only manufacturer that offers it for the maintenance staff, if you hit the and hold the uh, reset button in for three seconds, it runs the screen through an entire cleaning process so they can stand there and make sure that every component works properly. And typically to start and stop the screen, it's either float switches or an ultrasonic level sensor. So it really does have very simple controls. So in summary, we have more than 700 screens. It's probably been the most specified screen in North America for the last 20 years. Uh, most of our competitors who make similar products are made over in Europe. Uh, we make everything uh, in North America at Sheraton, Iowa. 
that gives us parts avail availability. I, you know, we consider the Canadians our, our neighbors. So, uh, you know, coming up here is, you know, for me, just like going to Florida. So uh, uh, we do offer parts avail availability, service and repair. The screens are all stainless, so they're not going to corrode. They're very heavy duty design with, with uh, very thick materials, so they're very durable. Uh, we machine all the mating services. If you're a mechanic, you know you want mating services to be machined. It's a very heavy duty drive design. Uh, the lower bearing is replaceable without screen disassembly. We offer two stage washing that gives dryer screenings and saves you costs and disposal. The other thing we do, all of our screens, we factory pre-plumb, pre pre-wire the units. So it's very uh, uh, easy for the installing electrician and plumber. Uh, they, ought, they bring the wires to one point. Uh, the plumber only has to make one connection. We offer premier weather protection if it's outdoors and also a tank mounted option. Uh, multiple control panel options. And I will just show you just some of the screens uh, quickly, other options that we do offer. This is our micro strainer, very similar screen. It's only good up to about 17 me megaliters per day, but it's very good for small plants. For plants that want much finer screening, we can go down to two millimeter with our rotating drum screens, and that's good up to just short of 60 megaliters. We also can do a pre-engineered headworks with any one of the three screens and provide grit removal in a pre-engineered tank. And we make those up to 17 megaliter per unit uh, in, uh, uh, what's a half MGD, Ken? Times four, uh, two megaliter increments. We also do a, a, a pre-engineered package where you use a Vortex grit system, which is what I'm going to talk about next, uh, up to about 75 megaliters per day. Uh, this happens to be a project up in Alaska we just did. If uh, any of the plants are taking in septage, uh, we are uh, the number one uh, manufacturer of septage receiving stations uh, in North America. We've done more than all of our competitors combined. We also do deep screening, uh, what we call our hydronic T screen. We can go down to about 30 meters in depth. So very, very deep applications. We also do unique screens, what we call a monorail on a cable. Uh, it's actually on a track where we can go down and screen uh, a bar screen or a portion of a bar screen, uh, traverse over to a dumpster, we can go around curves. Uh, it gives us a lot of flexibility. And then we also have the distinction of providing the largest trash rake uh, cleaner in the world. This is the Green River Power Station in Wenatchee, Washington on the Columbia River. The bar rack is uh, about 190 meters wide. Uh, the water depth is about 35 meters, and this unit's about 27 meters tall. You can drive a semi-tractor trailer under it. So we have a lot of capability as a company in providing different screening options. What am I doing here? Okay. Next product that we submitted on was what we call our Raptor Spire Grip. And just some photos, we have about 250 installations uh, throughout North America. The design parameter, just like the screens, it's des they're designed on the peak flow, not the average. And so for both the screens and the grit, when we submitted, I made an assumption uh, that the flow rates that you asked us to propose on were average or dry weather flows. I multiplied those numbers by two and a half, which is very typical if I don't know the number. So I based everything on a two and a half multiplier. We offer 10 different models, uh, anywhere from uh, about 3.8 to 265 megaliters per day, depending on uh, the flow coming in. 
Uh, the diameters are uh, 1.83 to 7.32 meters in diameter. We also offer, there are two configurations for Vortex grit removal, what we call 270 degree and 360 degree designs. And that really comes down to how the engineer lays out uh, the headworks. We offer these in carbon steel, 304 or 316 stainless. Uh, basically, there's uh, one motorized moving part. It's a rotating paddle or propeller. It keeps the organics in suspension by providing enough energy to stir up the organics, but not enough energy so that the grit settles to the bottom of the tank. Uh, our design, we can adjust the pitch and the paddle height for each job to optimize performance. The uh, drives are, are very low uh, kilowatt drives, 0.56 up to 1.5 kilowatts. Uh, the drives can also be provided with a variable frequency drive to adjust the speed to op optimize performance. The Raptor Spire grit, like most Vortex grit systems, it's going to remove 95% of 50 mesh or, or 297 micron grit, 85% of 210 micron grit, and 65% of 150 micron grit. And that's grit that has a specific gravity of 2.65. So grit tends to be much heavier than uh, water, which has a specific gravity of 1. The head loss through a vortex grit system is generally only about 6 millimeters at maximum flow, so there's very low head loss, which uh, when you're trying to save money, if you're pumping anywhere in the plant, the less head loss uh, you have, over the life of the project, you can have less pumping costs. This just shows a, a three-dimensional uh, uh, graphic of the various components, the drive assembly. Here's the paddle. The grit falls into this uh, storage hopper. There's usually a fluidization system, water or air, that stirs up the grit, and then you have some type of pump that pumps the grit out. And this is a, uh, a uh, CAD drawing showing a 270 degree design where the flow comes down the channel, flows around the tank, and goes out. And so uh, basically the flow is 270 degrees or three quarters of the you know, diameter or the circumference of that tank. We can also do 360 degree designs, uh, and this is good where you have dual units for bigger plants because you can, it's a lot easier to lay out uh, flow coming straight in, straight out. So the flow comes in, uh, goes down this ramp, and then goes around 360 degrees and goes out. For grit pumping, you have a couple of options. Uh, the grit goes into a storage hopper. We have a solenoid valve that opens prior to the pump coming on. We inject air or water to stir up the tank. It's kind of like a blender, only we're using water or air to do that. Uh, we can use three different types of pumps. An airlift pump, which is very simple. You just inject air and it, it uh, raises the grid up. We can do a dry pit vortex pump, something like a Hayward Gordon uh, pump. Uh, Hayward Gordon's a Canadian company that we work with. Or we can do a self-priming pump, and that was how I based the base design on the self-priming pump. Uh, the pumps are all hired iron construction, and that's very important. Uh, sand has a Brunel hardness. It's very hard, about 570 Brunel. So you want materials of construction that are, are as hard or harder than the sand. And so the, the Gorman Rupp pump, uh, as well as, say, a Hayward Gordon pump, all use hardened materials. Uh, the, the drives are either direct drive, we can put variable speed drives on. The pumps typically pump 10.7 to 5.8 liters per second. And then we typically have anywhere from a 2.2 to 11.2 kilowatt motor. It depends on how much flow and how high we have to pump the grit. Once we uh, remove the grit and pump it, we can go, what we want to do then is we want to wash it 
and dewater the grout. So we can do what we call a type L classifier. What I recommended for your projects are what we call a cyclone classifier. A cyclone, uh, I'll show you a picture of it in a second, but the advantage is if you pump 100 liters through a cyclone, 90 liters uh, are separated from the cyclone and don't have to go through uh, grit dewatering. So it cuts the volume of water into your, your dewatering device so that you only have to have uh, enough area to settle 10% of what you pump to the cyclone. So it removed 90% of the water prior to the, what we call the grit classifier. The cyclone has replaceable liners, so as they wear over time, they're a neoprene rubber. Uh, so they are field replaceable. The classifier dewaters the grit concentrate. And we can make those again in carbon steel, stainless, or 316 stainless. Uh, we use the same drive as the Raptor fine screen for commonality of parts. Uh, the screw conveyor has a hard weld on the edges of the screw. And that hard weld is 615 Brunel. If you re remember, uh, sand has a Brunel hardness of 570. And if you've ever uh, worked with earth moving equipment on the teeth or the blades, uh, they use uh, hard weld uh, that's field replaceable as the teeth or the blades wear. Uh, you can lay down new welds. Same uh, uh, type approach with our screws. And then the classifiers remove 95% of 150 mesh grit. It's actually uh, more efficient than the Vortex grit removal system. We want to be sure that that classifier captures all the grit that we removed. And this just shows a, a, a modern uh, computer CAD graphic where we have the drive assembly, uh, the self-priming pump. Here's the cyclone classifier. When we pump out, the pump pulls uh, the grid up, pumps it over to the cyclone classifier, and then 90% of the water uh, uh, is rejected. Only 10% of the water and the grit go into the classifier. The classifier then augers the grid out, and what you get is a very dry, almost looks like sandbox sand. And this is another rendering where we use one of our fine screens. It's an actual job we had where we have one of our fine screens, which is the first product I talked about, our Vortex grit removal system. In this application, they put the grit system outside, the pump inside, as well as the cyclone classifier. So we can do the equipment either indoors or outdoors. So in summary, uh, the spiral grits have high removal efficiency, uh, very flexible 270, 360 degree orientation. We've got three pumping options, uh, very simple grit classifier to give you a dry grit, very low organics. Uh, they're very simple to maintain. We can use a variety of uh, materials of construction, uh, carbon steel or stainless steel. And, we, and the controls are almost identical to our Raptor fine screens with all the options. We do offer a couple of other uh, systems that I didn't propose on, but just wanted to let you know that they are available. We do an aerated grit chamber. Uh, the advantage of this is there's no underwater moving parts. Again, simplicity. Provides good performance. Uh, the biggest one we make is up to uh, just over 83 megaliters per day. For smaller plants, up to uh, 22 uh, megaliters per day, we have an inline grit. This is like a giant classifier where we, uh, we aerate the grit, auger the grit out with a grit screw. Very simple uh, design. Now, uh, for some states in the U.S., the grit to be able to landfill, you have to get the organics down below 10%. They want very, very clean grit. It's, an, you know, for an environmental uh, consideration. You don't want to put real dirty grit into your landfill and, and cause problems and odors. And I noticed around here you got a lot of seagulls. And seagulls like to go pick the landfills, and so you don't want to put 
you know, nice smelly grit that att uh, attracts them. Uh, we offer a grit washer that we actually wash the grit using uh, plant effluent or plant water and it washes the organics out. This is fresh sand, this is day old sand. So this is very, very clean grit. A lot of times you'll see grit, it looks black and almost like black compost. A lot of organics in it. Let's see. The next product that we proposed on is what we call our Spiroflow Clarifier. And sometimes uh, old things are, uh, you know, considered old, outdated, antiquated. Uh, what we know in talking to the experts is, is uh, uh, since 1934, nobody's really been able to come up with a better improvement on a clarifier. Uh, our first unit in Flora, Illinois, uh, put in in 1934, is still in service. Uh, that's kind of an amazing record in today's disposable society. We have about 3,000 installations. And um, what we know in talking to the experts who have done testing on our unit is uh, uh, our unit is two to four times more efficient than other designs. So in all these years, uh, there have been a lot of things done to improve other clarifiers but they haven't been able to make them perform as well as our unit without adding a lot of money. So one advantage of the Spiroflow clarifier is has a lower overall cost of most circular clarifiers. Um, again, when we design clarifiers, I had to make an assumption in our proposals. Clarifiers are designed based on peak hour flow, not average dry weather or average day. So I made an assumption in sizing and, and providing budget pricing. We also look at solids loading, how many pounds or kilograms of solids we're putting in based on the diameter of the clarifier. So I look at both things. There have been numerous independent tests on the Spiroflow clarifier that other people have done to substantiate our claims. I never believed uh, salesman like Ken, when I was a real design engineer uh, uh, 25 plus years ago, you know, I always had to have proof. So we do have the proof. Uh, this is a study that was done at Iowa State University where they looked at a center feed clarifier, our spiral flow, and they injected dye, and then they measured how long it took for the dye to move through the clarifier. The red line is a center feed clarifier, the blue line is a spiral flow, and what the, the values mean is the average detention time was the same theoretically for both clarifiers, but it only took about 5.4 minutes for the peak concentration of dye to move through a center feed where it took 24 minutes for the spiral flow. What that means is, is we're using more effective volume in our clarifier than uh, a center feed type design. And so uh, these are just some numbers. Uh, this is the half area where half the dye went through. Uh, it went through in 30 minutes on the center feed, 37 minutes on the spiral flow. There was another study that was done at South Kingston, Rhode Island, and my friend John Essler, who's considered probably the foremost expert in clarifier design. He called me up and he says, I got a great dye test for you. And so we got a center feed right next to one of your old spiral flows. The center feeds were bigger diameter, bigger depth, but they were uh, uh, the same amount of volume of water per volume of clarifier. It was proportioned evenly. So you'd think that they should perform equally. Here's the dye test. Again, here's the center feed. Peak took 40 minutes on these clarifiers with a spiral flow. It took 70 minutes, which means the spiral flow is much more efficient when it really shouldn't be. Another test, if you have primary clarifiers, which is the first kind of physical process following screening and grit removal, what you want to do is remove as much 
of the solids as possible uh, from your process. And what this, uh, this first uh, red line shows, a center feed clarifier and our spiroflow. And at normal design rates, which were the average rates that you gave me to do our analyses, it really shows the clarifiers were performing equally. But as the flow increased, the spiral flow moved, removed about 29% of the solids versus only about 7% of the solids uh, were removed by a center feed. So the spiral flow where it really comes into play is at the peak flows. When you get rain, which I know you get a lot here, and by the way, thank you for the nice weather today. I planned on rain all week. Um, there was also a test done at Ewing Lawrence Sanitary District in Mercer County, New Jersey. It was a nine month study where they looked at primary clarifier performance. The center feed clarifiers were uh, 21.3 meters. Spiral flows were smaller uh, at 15.2 meters. Again, they had the same proportional flow rate going to each set of clarifiers. What they found in the study was uh, the spiral flows removed uh, a little more than 21% more solids than center feed. And so what's a spiral flow look like? All you need is a concrete tank. There is a baffle, what we call a skirt. It creates a race. And the flow comes into the unit, is directed in a spiral motion. That's how the clarifier gets its name. That baffle goes, normally a clarifier is, uh, what, about maybe four meters to five meters deep. The skirt goes to within about uh, half a meter of the bottom of the clarifier. What that does is, is the solids cannot short circuit between the inlet and the outlet because of that baffle. So the flow comes around, spirals up, comes into the central collection launders, and then flows out of the clarifier. The spiral flow is very good uh, in trapping scum. How many minutes do I have? Okay, I will move very fast then. This just shows again the hydraulics. Here you can see the skirt. Flow has to go in. It's impossible to short circuit this clarifier. The sludge then moves into the center and uh, is uh, removed out of the clarifier. It's also very good uh, for scum. Uh, I will tell you the skirt is not round, it tapers. Um, it's based on the flow and uh, for secondary clarifiers, the return sludge. The effluent launder weirs are, are proportional to the uh, length of the skirt. This shows where the flow comes into the tank. This is a picture of the skirt, the clarifier is empty. Uh, center feed clarifiers, which is uh, what we've been comparing to, they tend to trap a lot of scum where they shouldn't. Here the scum is in the feed well. Here's another pretty picture, an even better picture. Our clarifiers, this skirt, traps all the scum between the outer wall and, the, and uh, the baffle. This is the settling area. You can see how clean this is. We also provide a mechanical skimmer to move the scum that is trapped and it goes into a sludge draw off pipe. Uh, some, I'm going to skip because of time. We do offer uh, uh, other skimming devices, uh, actually a, a backup skimmer uh, with a drive assembly. Uh, it's a motorized skimmer to remove any floatable material that might get by the, the baffle or the skirt. And this just shows a design where uh, uh, we're skimming the solids. Here's another one where uh, the plant's not operating very well. You can see after the skimmer comes by, it's very, very clean. And we also do ducking skimmers, and I'll just move through this quick. And this is a ducking skimmer uh, that's uh, 
uh, moves the scum off the clarifier. So there's a pipe that draws the, the scum off the unit. And with that, I'm going to move. How many minutes do you want me to? We've, we're at 45 right now. Happy to have your entire presentation up on the website when it's done. But so go to wherever you want, and we can uh, we'll okay. save enough time for a couple of questions if there sure. are any. Sure. Uh, one of the last uh, the last product, and I'm I'm just going to talk a little bit about the performance of this, what we call our oxidation ditch. We were very innovative. Uh, uh, to bring the technology to the U.S., we introduced it. We have about 2,000 installations. And where's the nearest one, Ken? Well, we were in the central plant, but that's a very old plant. It's from but it's been running for years, and so uh, very effectively. So just for people at home, there's one in central Sandwich, but it's an old one. Um, in the uh, uh, request for proposal, um, we assumed that the base design was for uh, basic secondary treatment, 25 milligrams per liter BOD, 30 total suspended solids. Our closed loop reactor process or oxidation ditch as a standard does much better than that. It does a 10-10 one ammonia. And, uh, recent study that was done down in the state of Washington where they compared f the four most popular treatment processes down there. Kennedy Jenks did the design or the paper. They concluded that oxidation ditches or what we call our CLR process cost the least to install capital cost, cost the least to operate, provided consistently the best performance with the least amount of operator skill. And so you get high treatment uh, without having to be a, a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon. So it's very easy to operate. So typically we get, uh, I'm gonna just very quickly show uh, some of our installations. This is a, a project uh, in Montgomery, Minnesota. I came from uh, Minnesota as a consulting engineer. This is one of our customers. Uh, this is an oxidation ditch. And there's, uh, like any biological process, there's aeration involved. Uh, this plant has been designed for a high degree of treatment. It puts out three milligrams per liter BOD. Remember, secondary treatment is 25. Uh, four milligrams per liter uh, uh, total suspended solids. Uh, NH3N is ammonia. If uh, you uh, uh, do fishing, you know that ammonia is toxic to fish. We remove uh, the ammonia from normally 40 milligrams per liter coming into the treatment plant. Here it's barely detectable at 0.12 milligrams per liter. This plant is also designed to remove phosphorus. Uh, the phosphorus, uh, which is also a, a pollutant, uh, a fertilizer basically, uh, they achieve a 0.38 phosphorus at Montgomery. And that's about a 3.8 megaliter per day plant. We also do a folded design. I designed this uh, back in my earlier days in Winstead, Minnesota. 80% of the flow there was a dairy, which presents a lot of problems. And Winstead uh, puts out a 4 BOD, 7 TSS, 0.22 milligram per liter ammonia. We also do concentric channel designs. Conyers, Georgia is 7.8 megaliters per day. Here you can see the performance. Uh, very, very good performance. Uh, at a very, very reasonable cost. And then Pin Conning, Michigan is uh, uh, just like Central uh, Saanich, uh, and that is a concentric oxidation ditch with a spiral flow clarifier in the center. Um, again, you can see very, very 
high degree of performance. So with that, I'll, I'll maybe open up some questions. I did not see one person sleeping, so that must be you're interested. If I had seen you, I've got a squirt gun full of uh, plant wastewater. So we will take questions. Um, I just want to say we've been alerted that there were some problems going over the live stream with the audio. The good news is uh, there is a very clean backup recording, so this will be uploaded to the internet, and we'd be happy to include as a PowerPoint your entire presentation that you put together for people to look at uh, at will. We will continue on. The, uh, the gerbils known as Dan and Dave are working to resolve the, anything that can be there as quickly as possible, but we will make sure people understand that they can, for, who are having trouble listening to the live feed, they should download this entire presentation. So with that said, questions. Or did you do that? Yes, sir. One question you were talking earlier on about uh, a, a unit for removing grit, but you only use it 400 to 600 hours a year. I was cu curious oh, why you picked that. Very good question. A vortex grit removal system, any grit removal system, no matter whose you're talking about, you've got flow coming in continuously, it runs continuously. So that little paddle drive, that runs continuously. It's uh, anywhere from, what, 0.56 to 1.5 kilowatts, so it's not a lot of energy. Um, the pump and the grit classifier, which are the other motorized components, those probably on the average run five to 10 minutes once per hour. It depends on how much grit you have. Uh, some plants have very little and that's a common question that I get, is how much grit are you planting on? Well, if you went to 100 plants in Canada, I guarantee you there wouldn't be one that would be the same. It depends on the age of your sewers. If your sewers were like uh, many in the states, in, the, in uh, the bigger cities, or in the old mining towns of Minnesota where the pipe is vitrified clay pipe from the 1930s, you're gonna get a lot of grit. Uh, if you're down near the beach and you have uh, uh, sewers like that, you're going to get a heck of a lot of grit. But if you have new sewers with uh, new polyethylene or polypropylene pipe with tight joints, new manholes, uh, the only grit you're going to get is whatever uh, uh, coffee grounds you put down uh, the sink. So that's about the only uh, material classified as grit that will get into uh, newer type uh, collection systems. We probably have some shopping carts going through ours. The shopping cart was an interesting story. That was in Roanoke, uh, North Carolina uh, during a hurricane. And don't ask me how it got in there, but uh, this was a bigger plant and uh, it came uh, down about a 96 inch interceptor and right into the screen. Well. The screen couldn't quite eat it. It did chop it up pretty good, but it did have to be removed. Any further questions? So again, if some come to mind, uh, certainly through westsidesolutions.ca, um, through the website, we'll be happy to connect with the presenter here. And I, mm -hmm. um, I just want you to know that a um, long time ago when I was the manager of local government for the Ministry of Environment, I got a tour of what is now the preliminary screening and the worst thing they ever pulled out of their screen was a big anchor. So, just to keep that in mind. I have seen, I have heard of alligators. Uh, I've seen just about everything. Anchor. Except for a dead body. So, so I'd like to thank our presenter uh, for coming. <laughs> <laughs>